Okay, we are recording. I am with Paul. Paul, how are you, my friend? I'm good. How are you? I mean, well, I guess friend is a bit of an overstatement, right? This yeah, is, that's, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, we, I think we sat beside yeah. each other on a bus at Bruce's event. I, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> that was like the extent of our relationship, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. I feel like you're a friend because I, I Every, you know, people talk about you all the time. I think that Bitcoin is actually kind of, um, it's like a very traumatic war, you know, <laughs> and everyone is like going through all this. It's a tremendously alienating thing. So, because many of your friends and family like don't get it and they have never gotten it and they definitely didn't get it back in whenever when you so true explained it to them and now they don't really know how to think of you and no one really knows like what you're going through except for the other bitcoiners so i do think that there is a kind of you know bitcoin ptsd or bitcoin gang or something that binds us all together Okay, well, yeah, I, I can get down with that one because I do have a tendency of starting with that. Uh, and I just feel like, yeah, even, I mean, you I have known for years, but even people like I'll, I'll meet someone just like last week and they'll tell me about their Bitcoin project and they're, how they're building a, you know, self custody wallet with lightning and this and that. I'll be like, uh, like brothers from different mothers. Let's go. Let's do this. Uh, so, okay. Uh, you, we wanted to switch it up today, right? Normally I start with people's story, uh, but I guess we're going to kind of do the reciprocal of that today. So we're going to start with my last question first. Uh, so it doesn't matter what your name is, who you are, what your story is to start with. Let's start first with what is a asymmetrical truth? What is some truth that you hold that most other Bitcoiners or people in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, see, I think people should get, they should get, they should be able to get to know me first and then they decide whether or not they care about the story. But I have, so the one that is, it's tangentially related to Bitcoin. Um, but in general, the answer to that question of just, and with respect to everything is that probably a lot of the people you love will die because election gambling is frowned upon in American culture. So that is this weird screwball belief that I have um well you got to rewind and you got you got to hit me with that one again you got to hit me with that way wait hold on wait wait wait, what say that again i i kind of i kind of caught it yeah so it's so i'm a big believer in this prediction markets concept but the excitement that most bitcoiners and libertarians have for it only scratches the the surface of the tremendous potential um this institution has to just fix I don't really want to say fix everything, but it can fix a certain type of problem, which is the who watches the watchman problem. So like you can imagine a pyramid in your mind where like the CEO is at the top or the Congress people are at the top um, or the editor in chief if you're from academia, like I'm from academia, the editor in chief of some journal is at the top and then there's senior academ- academics with prestige and then it, it filters down and at the bottom you have research assistants or you have like whatever staff, janitors, whatever. Mm-hmm. of these other people and this produces some outcome and the people when you have subordinates you have a lot of control over them you monitor them if you're happy with their work you um promote them or reward them but if you're not happy you can you can fire them and people don't want to be fired so they work hard they work hard enough they at least there's some feedback for laziness they get kicked out if they're too lazy but what about the people at the top what keeps them accountable and the answer right now is not very much. I mean, the, the CEO is accountable to the stock price, but it's very, very difficult. The CEOs, they're working every day. They're 24-7. Mm. You know, their brain is inside the company, and they're touching everything. Everything that the company is, they have a hand in. And how can you possibly even understand, begin to understand, like second-guess their choice? Like they can, You can say, well, the stock price would have been higher. The stock price of Tesla would have been higher if Elon Musk did this or didn't do this or whatever. You have no idea. The board of directors is theoretically in charge of the CEO. They could fire the CEO. But they, you know, those are some people that meet like four times a year. What are they going to do? They have no idea if um, they have no idea if uh, Elon Musk is doing the right thing or not. Often the chairman of the board is the CEO's friends. This this is a million times worse in the um, because a corporation is ultimately accountable to bankruptcy, to sales and to bankruptcy. So the corporation doesn't do well. The company eventually goes out of business, you know. But in in political world, it's even worse because you know the best you can hope for is a change of party, 
leadership from, you know, Republican to Democrat in the United States. And it's much worse in Europe when there's like, a, they have a proportional representation where you can, you can barely ever get anything changed. Wait, hold on. But I want to go back to your first sentence of this, of what we just said, yeah. which was what? You, you said something along the line. Well, yeah, repeat well, what you said. And like, many, I, I want to people, figure that out. Huh? Many of the people you love will die because, because economic growth <laughs> and medical research and, and such and such will be what it is. Even things like, you know, mental health or whatever. Everything yeah. will just be better. A, the prediction market institution has the ability to um, completely reform the way these people at the top are held accountable to to some kind of you know tangible result and so the potential for improvement is almost unlimited i mean the the things that the us government currently does that holds back economic growth i mean free trade is just one thing free trade would be like free and someone has calculated that the return on investment for that or the the gains in of trade from that would be like something like an 11 million percent ROI. I could look to find this study, but it's like it's it's a silly thing. The, the benefits would be extreme. The cost is nothing. That's just one thing, you know, of many. Um, but the the kind of laziness and the kind of political games that people play, both within the corporation and in um, civic political life. That's all something that you could really um, stamp out almost completely with this one institution that we would have had naturally by itself. It, it, it's very old. It's as old as the hills. There was, there's, you can track, people would bet on who would be elected pope since like the 1300s, 1200 AD. There's all this. And they, of course, in the UK, they bet on everything just for fun. But the US is this super important, super Puritan place. And it hates gambling. And it hates the CFTC has written, despite, you know, there's been like multiple papers by, there's like a one called the Power of Prediction Markets. It's signed by like 30 people, including multiple Nobel Prize winners, arguing for deregulation of this institution, but it's, it's regulated just out of existence. You can't, you are not allowed to even do this. It took forever to get like the special exemption in this one university. So you bet, people could bet like $500 maximum per person, which is not enough. Uh, all of it could be, all this stuff could be fixed. All, even things like Fed policy or whatever, whatever you want to do, you could do it better with a prediction market. But How? It, and we would have had it Why? accidentally. Why? How does a prediction market fix all of this? There's Because the potential is untapped. So most people have only heard of like this one thing where it's like you win the dollar if uh, Donald Trump is reelected, you win a, or you win a different dollar if Joe Biden is elected. And you have these two things. And one of those two is going to be elected. So um, they trade in the marketplace and they trade maybe the Donald Trump shares were 30 cents on the dollar and the Biden shares were 70 percent, 70 cents on the dollar. This, you know, this would indicate that Trump has a 30 percent chance of winning. Biden has a 70 percent chance of winning. And so that's what people are used to. They just they're Well, even that people have a, a big problem concluding that this represents some kind of objective knowledge um, and that if it were if the if people knew somehow that biden would win they would all sell the trump sh shares for 30 cents because they they're imminently worth zero they buy the biden shares for 70 cents they're imminently worth one dollar so they can get a huge roi in a few days 70 cents to one dollar um, uh, but th this this idea the idea of just aggregating all the information on one topic, like even something like um, what will the global average surface temperature be next year as reported by this NASA satellite? Like if you wanted to do a global warming type thing, global warming is this abstract nebulous thing. Whereas you can make it concrete with some measurement. You say, here's a satellite. It's going to measure this thing. Now, maybe you don't care about the satellite or maybe you don't care about how NASA calculates surface temperature abnormality. But you see, then the conversation can at least make progress. You can say, well, I have a problem with this satellite. And you say, fine, what about this other satellite? Or what about 20 satellites? We'll average them together. Or what about some other thing we'll do? You know, we'll take the National Weather Service from every country or whatever. You can, the, the conversation will make progress. But most disputes really aren't about anything. They're just about, you know, who gets respect from whom. And they're this, this is petty kind of monkey politics. Um, 
from the Stone Age that we can't shake off. Uh, but in many other domains, we just shake it off. Like when you're trying to install plumbing in your house or do, accomplish any normal task, you just say, well, does it work yet? And you just keep changing it until it works. But we haven't been able to shake this, all this politicking off. So the, so, but this is just narrowly with one dimension. You just say, okay, I'm just gonna measure what is the surface temperature going to be next year or five years from now or 10 years from now. You can say, this is gonna pay one cent for every surface temperature abnormality in the year 2030 or something. And then, you know, you have to c calculate time value of money a little bit. It's a little confusing and opportunity costs if you had invested in the stock market. But basically, if that number starts going up all of a sudden, it means that people think that the earth is going to, the global surface temperature is going to be warmer. So it kind of just ends this dispute. Uh, but if, they, if, it, if it plummets or stays the same, then people think it, it, um, it won't be much warmer. And so the problem isn't as big of a deal. Now, the issue though is this is just with one dimension. And when you change this from one dimension to several dimensions, you solve a lot of problems. So a lot of people will say something like, sure, the, we won't have this, a lot of, the global surface temperature abnormality in the future will be low. The problem will be solved, but that's only because we'll do something about it. We'll pass whatever, the carbon plan or whatever it is. So it doesn't actually solve any problems. Or people will say stuff like, Sure, Hillary Clinton is trading. This people said this to me four years ago. They say Hillary Clinton is trading really high. That's just because you know she's so evil and sorceress that she's going to win, and there's nothing we can do about it. It doesn't say anything about whether or not who should win or something like that. But you can break this up. Is what I'm. Is what is. This is my mission to to try to bring this to the world. Is you you have instead of having yes and no, which is just two questions. And there's just one question, like basically, will the Republican win, yes or no? And you're having um, Trump be 30 cents and Biden be 70 cents. You can break it up into lots of other things. You can say, will, will, will the unemployment rate be low? Will we have a good economy? You know, just to make it super oversimplified. It's like, will the Republican win? Will the economy be good? And you have four states. One pays if the Republican wins and the economy is good. One pays if the Republican wins and the economy is bad. One pays if the Democrat wins and the economy is good. One pays if the Democrat wins and the economy is bad. And from there, you can do all kinds of you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication. You get everything you got before, but you get also this relationship with the, the, the numbers clump up on a line, all the Republican winning economy good numbers over there and the economy bad Republican losing numbers, if they clump up on a line, it shows that they are related statistically. It gives you advice. It says, if I vote Republican, the economy will be better or vice versa. So it's, if we do this climate plan, the temperature will be different. If we do this business maneuver, the stock price will go up. If Tesla does this, discontinues the Cybertruck or, or doubles down on the Cybertruck or whatever it is, Hey, hey, Paul, I have a question. Okay, so this, this is, so, so this now is like, with that, you hold the leader accountable. That's the point. This so is leaders should be mm. as accountable as Uber drivers, where you get rated five stars every time you get constant feedback. They should be working really hard and they should be uh, punished for inefficiency. The same way as everyone else should, you know, when you go to work, you should be giving it your all. You should be improving every day and it should be difficult. But then, you know, when you go home, I mean, you should get a lot of money also. And we should all live in a rich economy full of awesome stuff that everyone wants that's cheap and high quality. Okay. Um, yeah, I know that was kind of So hard. this is about, so this is about, is this about prediction markets, right? So it's about uh, yes. predicting the future, right? Which is obviously interesting and fascinating. Um, uh, and so... My first question is, is that why is this seen as gambling or why is it illegal in some countries? Like that, that's my first question. I mean, I, well, well, yeah, just, like, why? Like, like I mean, if gambling. people aren't, you're not hurting anyone. Like if you I and know. some other well, dude want to. Well, we and anyone who's libertarian has been like. Oh, okay. So that's. Trying that for a long time, right? They've been like, it, what's the, it's like if it neither breaks my arm nor picks my pocket or something. Right. This I mean, the, this yeah, is the yeah. struggle. Yes. This is the struggle of, of all of all people, I mean, over time, I think against, 
you know, against tyranny, um, tyranny, collectivism. No, no, but why? What's the what was? I mean, there was must have been yeah. something that happened or something went wrong. Is it like? But, but, yeah, but I'm just trying to think. Like, how do they conflate? Yeah, there's a long history. But oh, as okay. I said, there, there is a long history of actually doing the betting. Um, people have been betting, you know, and on who will win the UFC fights for Pope and all these other things for hundreds of years. Oh yeah, I'm just saying, but people, people do bet. bet today, even yeah, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't bet, yeah. but like people go on websites all but the time. There's been a long trend, like a, a long time ago. There was life insurance was seen as immoral. That was seen as betting that your spouse would die. So it was seen as very irresponsible, and it like interfered with the church. You know, this was back in back in the day when mm. everyone in America was like lived in a little farm church community. If your spouse died, you know, the church, the community would take care of you. So there was like suspicious, you know, it competed with the other institutions of the day. But it, it is kind of weird, right? It, and even there is an idea, there's even a kind of trope of um, the gold digger spouse killing the person like for the life insurance money or something. You know, the guy takes out a life insurance policy, big life insurance policy, and then he die, disappears in a boating accident or something. Um, oh, dude, I know all about I used to sell life insurance. I, I know all about it like 20 so years ago. It used to be <laughs> considered immoral, but now it's not at all. Now it's if you have a family, it's considered quite bizarre to go without mm. life insurance. In fact, mm. It's flipped completely. All kinds of stuff. The stock market used to be seen as gambling. There used to be a phrase, gentlemen don't trade puts, which is truly absurd. This was about Chicago Board of Options. This is like Chicago was like in the middle of all these farms. Mm. These people did all this banking in America with the Mississippi River and blah, blah, blah. And um, and so they had to, there was all the seasonal variation. There was all this risk. So they got into, they got big into insurance and they got big into like trading futures for crops and things. And this is why, this is like Chicago got big. And like, I don't know, I don't know exactly when this would be like Gilded Era, late 18. 1850 to 1900, I guess. I don't, I don't remember the exact dates, but Chicago started all this stuff up, became this big financial center. Um, and but there was this phrase that um, you weren't supposed to trade puts. A put is when you bet a call option makes money if the thing goes up in price. A put option makes money if the thing goes down. So a put is kind of insurance. But there was this stigma. It was like seen as wrong, even though it's laughable if you think about it for two seconds. I mean, think about it in international forex. Like, think if you're, what if you're trading like the, the British pounds per yen rate, but you live in America? It's like, which one is even a put and which one is even a call? It's like, <laughs> absolutely no difference. It's like, but that's my point. That, that was my next question is like futures and all that stuff. Isn't that betting on the future to some extent? Yes. Well, see, every single. So then why is that allowed, but no then you're not action allowed? That we take, every action you take has some sort of, you know, if you walk to the post office, you're betting that the post office will be open when you get there. You know, it's like uh, so. No, so where's that line? I'm I'm not gonna lie. That's I've always point. stayed that's away from gambling or even betting on these types of things because, yeah. in my brain, I couldn't figure out like where does the world like where where is it like like where are you allowed? <laughs> like it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like it's well, it's so funny. It's like people aren't allowed to play games. Like games well, bad. The, the issue <laughs> is uh, well, there's a big difference between so if you go to like a casino. The odds are fixed and they're against they're not in your favor so something's up you know because everything is, yeah everything is a negative expected value so but that's cool why is, why is anyone there wait so lottery yeah a lottery. lottery the state the state in the united states the state runs a lottery like what is going on right now <laughs> no, it's, it's just a mistake is what i'm saying it's no different than with the life insurance and with the stock market oh the stock market is important i mean life insurance is important because you should be able to provide for your family if you die and it shouldn't depend on the way how popular you are you know with your friends that's uncivilized and barbaric you know and plus what's the guy who gets there first like and he hasn't had an opportunity to get standing in the community but his actuarial risk is the same why should he suffer in a world with no life insurance but similarly in capital markets you know if you have a great business idea should you have to work as a waiter or whatever for like 30 years and save up all the money to finally start that idea. Meanwhile, down the street, there's some rich retired person who wants a better return on their investment. They want to turn their money into more money. Why can't the two of you just link up? You can, they can be the investor in your business. You can start it t tomorrow. 
Mm -hmm. That's the point of having free capital markets and all that stuff about puts. That was just like, you know, I don't know what that was. Maybe there was some reason for it that makes some kind of sophisticated sense, like a Nassim Taleb like reason that we don't completely understand in our modern culture. But, you know, when you can't, when you can short, when you can bet on things going down, that is healthy. Part of the problem with the U.S. housing market is you cannot short it. So when the prices go up, everyone starts buying and they'll become house flippers. But there's no way to short. So once you know, once you think there's a bubble, this is before all that stuff that Michael Burry, like mortgage backed security stuff. Um, there was like, there's, you can't like short someone, your neighbor's house, you know, you can't even take out, you can't even take out like homeowners insurance. You have to have like what they call an insurable interest. Um, but you can't, you can't bet that the houses around you will go down in price. Um, if you could, it probably would, would pop the bubble before it really got going. So you would probably be if you can short things, you it's bubble it, it's bubble suppression technology. It fix it smooths out all these cycles and hmm. it stops them from becoming really euphoric is when they become super irrational and then they start to do a lot of damage because then they they have that extra momentum to just go crazy and then it's super crash back down. Yeah. So, so the short the, the thing about gentlemen don't trade puts, that was like absurd on its face. The, it's, the whole thing has been absurd. What we should just have is liberalism, people allowed to just you know, do whatever they want as long as it doesn't harm a third party, which this absolutely does not. Yeah, right. Okay, so, okay, so, okay. <laughs> so this, is the next, this is the next stage, but what I'm trying to impress on people is that your life would, would will be so much better eventually. I don't know if it'll take 100 years, but eventually it will reach something like this. And of course, they're going to look back and they're going to say, look at these stupid debates that these people would do. This is what a joke this was. It's, you know, 30 seconds for your healthcare policy, 60 seconds on whatever national defense. In the future, people will just publish a lot of stuff. It'll be evaluated by experts the same way hedge funds evaluate companies. And they'll just battle it out in the markets on who will have the best GDP growth, who will have the best unemployment rate, who will have the best, who have the fewest deaths in the country, or who will have the longest life expectancy or education, or anything else you can measure. They'll just battle it out in these markets. The voters will show up on election day. They'll check, see everyone's numbers. It'll be like a menu, getting a menu in a restaurant. You don't have to know anything about how they make the, whatever it is, the tiramisu. They just see, this is exactly what you'll get. This is the cost. This is exactly how much money the government will spend. And then they'll just go in and they'll, they'll, they'll still get to choose one party over another, but they'll have all this great information. And if anyone does, is super irrational. If anyone is, if any party is known, it's not, it has nothing to do with what they say. If it's known that if they are elected, they will behave irrationally, their numbers will be worse before they're even, before they even have the opportunity to be elected. They'll know on election day to avoid whichever party that is. So life would be totally different. You won't have any of this about, and then of course, these people are all professional manipulators. They have all these psychologists they hire and these pollsters, the social media algorithms. They have all this stuff designed to get, get, get into your brain with this emotional um, stuff about like, um, you know, like how you need to vote for this person. Otherwise it's the end of the, it's the end of your culture. It's the end of the world. Those, those people are coming, the poor people, the immigrants or whatever, the Jews, they're coming to destroy society and you have to do X, Y, Z or, um, you know, it's like, um, yeah, this, you have to vote for this party because it's the only one that will be compassionate to this marginalized group. And only you, if you don't vote for this party, it's just because you're racist or homophobic or whatever. Not, not all of that is just because they're trying to buy election results with, with, you know, advertising and polling. They do all this stuff. They know everyone down to, they've got everything down to science. They know all the neighborhoods. They know who is the single issue voter on gun control. They send them the gun control thing. The neighbor gets a completely different thing. They get a thing about LGBT rights. They, this, they know everything, the, the, the pollsters. The, they, they got everyone's credit card data. They got everything. So they're manipulating people into voting a certain way. And yeah, as we know, one way is through logic and reason, but that is not as that is expensive and not as reliable as you know all the cheap shots 
So you have all this stuff about a father and son not talking to each other because one of them is a Trump supporter or something. All of that would go away in my fantasy world. This there would just be this would be a boring thing like um I don't know, it'd be like it's like it'd be like Crest versus Colgate. You go to CVS and you want to buy toothpaste. Both of them high quality product, both at a good price. If you decide you're tired of one, you just switch to the other. But since the free market is there, you can't, you know, it's like you go in now it's like you go in to buy toothpaste and it's like Crest is like forty thousand dollars. And and gives you like brain cancer immediately, and Colgate is like fifty five thousand dollars, and um, you know you die slowly of sepsis or something. It's like so these are like two horrible products, and they don't improve. But if you just had this mechanism to punish the people who make it worse, then it would just get better over time as as rapidly as possible. I think. So that's my quirky thing, and not a lot of people agree with me, as as you can imagine. It's not so much that people disagree; to... they just like people like don't you know they don't know what to say to this. I, I, okay, I, I want to make it a little bit like let's use an example. Okay, so yeah, for sure. example, uh, when Trump came down the elevator, I'm not even American, right? So it doesn't like I can't really vote or anything. But when he came down the elevator, I was like. I think within two days, I was like, this man is the future president of the United States. Like, definitely, like 100%. I've been, I've been, I've met enough Americans to know that this man <laughs> is the future American president. And my dad literally stopped talking to me. So how does, yes. you know, how does your world, um, and he did because, you know, he didn't believe that. And he thought Trump was an, and every, I think one week he was like, this guy, this, this guy is going to beat him. And then no, 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 now it's going to be that guy. And one by one, they all fell off and then Trump won. But I mean, like, yeah, but I'm just curious. So I did. Yeah. So how, how, how you would have prevented that in your it's world? A, it's a mixture of a lot of things. I think my, well, it's my diagnosis of why that happened to you and why it happens to everyone else is, is a mixture of things. But I think all of them would be solved. Maybe not all of them. We, we have an instinct to, you know, pick leaders and like project ourselves into them. So if people have different leaders, then this is fine. But the, the issue is why does it matter? There's a lot of issues. Like, will he win? Like I had friends like that too. I was at bar trivia with my friends and they said, there's no way that Trump can win. And I said, well, in the betting markets, he has like a 30% chance of winning. But this, but people don't even know what to say to that because they're used to a certain script where some you just think your guy is going to win. You can't see it any other way. The idea of even even of putting percentage points on it is is foreign to people. Hmm. Uh, but people couldn't believe that he had thirty percent, and then that was in twenty sixteen. He did, and then he won. <laughs> so it's like you know um, that. Um, so a part of it would be self-awareness that you don't know everything. And it's like, why would you comment on, like, what if you wanted to comment on something like Tesla? You know, that's your right. You could say, there's no way Tesla is going to sell more than 20,000 cars of this type in a certain month. Hmm. But you see, like, it's like, who cares? Either that will happen or it won't. There's hmm. no, like, there's no... People use politics as like a kind of stage so they can perform. They can show hmm. parts of themselves to their friends, their allies. So that's part of it. But I would strip all that away and I would make it this this dry, boring thing. You wouldn't even need to know. The politicians wouldn't even need to campaign. They just put out their stuff. They wouldn't even need to put out their stuff because the market, it's like a CEO. It's like when you interview a CEO for a job, you don't necessarily need to interview them. If you somehow secretly knew that they would be the best. In my world, you can make your little trades so that if they're chosen and they do a good job, you make a ton of money. But if they're not chosen, then you lose then you you also make money. It's, you can start you, or you get a refund. So you lose nothing. And if the only way you lose money is if they are chosen and they do badly. So you can set up this trade so the only way you lose money is if they're chosen to be the leader and they do a bad job. So then you can just with, without even talking to them at all, just if you somehow knew God visits you in a dream and, and lets you in on a secret, by the way, this is the most qualified person. You don't even need to, to um, they don't even need to campaign or anything. So, and this is for the CEO or for president or for whatever. So it, it would just be less salient in the culture in general. That's one thing. 
we, another uh, thing though is that just if you, if you just have a percent that's what i'm saying you'd say you'd be saying this guy's gonna win and your father would be saying no he won't but somewhere there would be one percent that uh, some percentage value that's the same for both of you and neither of you really have any basis for disputing it just like the tesla car sales in a certain month figure it's like there's a projection you know, you don't really know. You, you're not really a specialist. A lot of people, they know what their friends think. Do they know? Do they even know that only 10 or by some count eight states matter because those are the only eight swing states? Do they know that there are only so many persuadable voters in those swing states? Do they know what those people want? You know, a lot of people, I have friends in, from Connecticut or friends of California. Those are both blue states. It doesn't matter what anyone in those states think, you know, at all to who's going to be elected president. And many of those people can't name their, you know, they can't even name the senators or representatives in their own state. So you're talking about a future where, um, where like people's ideas and thoughts are like, are measured over time and and whether they're have you ever heard of ray dalio have you ever heard of like how he runs his like hedge fund i actually interviewed at at bridgewater interesting interesting no because i read his book and and it just strikes me as like something that um yeah he gives it away to people who interview him not him personally but oh the book they give it to you if you come there yeah well i i I bought it myself but i'm just saying is like i i found a lot of what so 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 this whole idea of oh what was that that he has this tool that he uses i forget what it's called just radical criticism well well everything and they said they just everything is scrutinized well scrutinize but what i found really fascinating about it is he has this like this literally this tool that in real time as he's hosting let's say a meeting with a hundred of his employees he, they're able to People give him to say this sucks be like this, <laughs> this sucks is this is right this is wrong or whatever whatever and in the back this like yeah. this matrix like, like yeah. system is tabulating paul so be like this you know markets it'd be and, like if you're watching an nfl game and there's like a score and you see how much points are they likely to get and the guy throws an interception and the numbers just in real time immediately yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he talks about this world where I mean this com- this company that he's built where he's essentially like like I said you have a weight so and it measures over time how accurate you are. So if you if nine out of ten things you've always said is always like accurate, like you said this is gonna happen, Bitcoin price is gonna go up, and it does, and you said this and this and this, they have like this way to actually kind of quantify well, this markets improve on that but this is a similar thing he obviously, hmm. he's obviously trying to hold himself accountable the same way i think every ceo should be held accountable which is like all the time and for everything so for everything for every word not just I mean, but, uh yeah but i did i get I'm it marginally asking, right <laughs> i'm not asking any more of them than they would ask for their own employees so i'm not i don't want everyone to be like you know enslaved to this system where they have to work super hard we want to live in a world where when you go to work you work hard and you try to be the best at what you do every day that's what's best for everyone and yes work, work is more fun i think but even if it's not even if that ends up being horrible just we would live in an economy where every single good and service would be such a high quality you think about it, it would be to be done by someone who not only them but all of their bosses up to the ceo is working as hard as possible to make it cheap and high quality for you. So every single thing would be like dirt cheap and just super great. So that's what we want. We want a world where when you're at work, you work. And then when you go home, you have the most fun in the world and you can take the best vacations. Yeah. You know, people can have like 12 weeks of vacation a year or whatever it is, but when you're at work, you should be, you should be a killer. You should be the best at, at what, whatever it is you do. But Ray Dalio's thing, I mean, that, that is um, that idea of past performance informing future results. That is, a, that, has, that is called induction. And that has always, that has haunted people who study this type of thing. Epistemology, like what is true? How do we know what will happen in the future? You know, what does it mean to know that, you know, you know what will happen in the future versus being deluded? Um, you know, that's not a great uh, prediction markets are actually better than that because with prediction markets, you, you know yourself. So you say, I know I got 99 out of the last hundred things wrong, but I know exactly why. Every time I know why it was because of such and such. But now the hundredth time, I know that 
I know that I'm going to get it right. Now, with prediction market world, you can like mortgage your house. You can do like what people did with Bitcoin and just bet it all on that one thing because now you know that you're right. Before, you weren't really sure. Maybe you only bet $20 each time. See, so you have a self. You can impose your own confidence. Um, you have your own self-assessment. You self-select. So you say, I don't know anything about, you know, I don't know anything about if what frozen concentrated orange juice futures are going to do tomorrow. I don't know about anything about what Tesla is going to do tomorrow, really. I mean, I have an opinion like every other person, but I don't know, you know? So why do I, I'm not going to bet on the share price, you know, but I'm going to bet on something that I know about. And if I somehow, if I know something that other people don't know, now I'm going to bet big, but mostly I just bet nothing. So I don't know. So I think that's an improvement over that scheme that you outlined where people are just well, solicited for opinions like at random and then they're assessed based on the performance historical performance paul okay oh, wow we just we, we just did, did an hour-long introduction uh <laughs> to the or whatever my question that normally only takes a few minutes but this is super fascinating i think i'm going to start doing this more often okay but i have a question well, oh, I, have a different man, one in bitcoin I don't even know where to go what's the thing that you agree <sighs> that you believe that most people don't and in bitcoin yeah be my project drive chain and that it's can you talk about that a little bit yeah well can you talk about drive the chain origin of drive chain is because i have this other product the prediction market project that was called truth coins now called bitcoin hive mind you can go to bitcoinhivemind.com and have a cool little video there about this futarchy thing that's only 20 minutes that I gave it in Acapulco, um, 2019, I think, uh, that people can watch if they want to hear more about whatever that was. But um, that, that was software that I, I wrote this paper about in 2014, early 2014. And then I wanted, this is, this is like a, blockchain peer-to-peer -peer Oracle software. So it would figure out whether or not Trump won or not, and then it would pay out people the right way. And it would also do all the market stuff. And it would do all this multidimensional stuff that I wanted as well. So it would do everything. This is this design. And, um, and so then I worked, it's a long story, but I produced the software in 2015 as its own kind of blockchain, but I didn't want it to be an altcoin and Blockstream was getting really big with the side chains idea at the time. So I was I thought they would Blockstream would come out with some kind of side chains thing that I could use to bolt it onto Bitcoin. This was a long time ago. But then in late 2015 it became obvious that Blockstream had kind of given up on this original idea of the side chain, which was this solution to the problem of altcoins. You know, there was all this stuff coming out, Ethereum bit shares, you probably remember. There was other stuff like counterparty that was like sort of on Bitcoin, but it's on blockchain and sort of weird other things. So all this stuff was coming out and it wasn't all obviously super fraudulent. Like in the ancient times, you had like Bitcoin, then you had the second blockchain actually was Namecoin, which is a great idea. And it still is a good idea, but it's just, it's, you know, it hasn't quite found its, um, it hasn't quite, it would be better as a side chain, first of all. Um, but second of all, it has some other complexities that it hasn't quite worked through yet, but that has tremendous potential. I mean, with something like Namecoin, you could have one login for every single site, including sites that don't exist yet. So you Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, it would all just be the same account tied to the same name. You could have age, so you wouldn't need to worry about being impersonated. You wouldn't need to tell people, here's my Instagram, here's my whatever, like in a big multi giant paragraph. Or, so that's a separate story. What I really wanted to get at is Litecoin was this the first like truly offensive altcoin where it was just this copy paste. Bitcoin does all this work to go from zero to like the super cool thing. And then Litecoin like copies and pastes it. And it's like, yeah, look at me. I'm also great, you know? And that's yeah, it'll change like, three parameters or yeah, something like exactly. that. Exactly, <laughs> right, yeah, the block time. Yeah, so um, that was like kind of offensively that was like, you know, I, it was not only kind of a stupid idea, but it was like just, just so brazen and sort of absurd. And then there was a lot of like terrible altcoins after that, but they started to get some that could have had some kind of plausibility to them. And in fact, with Counterparty, counter, we had stuff like Mastercoin and Counterparty early on. They were kind of weird. But they were onto something, which was 
what later became the ICO. And, and the ICO is terrible. Like I think so far, basically every ICO has been like a total scam and a terrible idea. But in principle, the idea of the ICO is, you know, it should be allowed and it should be on Bitcoin because Bitcoin should just do anything the customer wants. Bitcoin should be there ready to, ready to go. It should also be ready to go if you want small blocks and you don't want junk in the blockchain. So, but the, you know, Bitcoin should be doing everything that everyone wants, but uh, including the people who want a very conservative version of Bitcoin. So this is the kind of the, this is kind of where this is all going, which is the side chains idea was people want different things. We'll just let them all have their own software and they'll all be interoperable. Same 21 million Bitcoins, but weird. If you want their weird Dan Larimer project of the week, or if you want Ethereum, that was supposed to be RSK rootstock that started like in 2015. So um, that was the point of that. And so I had reached a point where I had finished Bitcoin hive mind, the prediction markets project, but there was no side chains technology to bolt it into Bitcoin core. So I kind of threw out my own idea in November of 2015, which was drive chain. And then in 2016, I kind of like fleshed it out more. Although the basic design hasn't changed, it just like added more details and responded to more questions. And then it slowly became clear that um, there was like this weird, there was, it was a problem of belief, as you say, when you asked me about, you know, what's the thing you believe that other people don't. There, there are all these strange like beliefs about, um, about side chains that actually would have prevented any, most of the people who were working at Blockstream at the time from ever even like finishing the project of inventing side chains. So I kind of like had to do it myself. And I also, um, with, with DriveChain, we built like the, the software that does these two BIPs, BIP 300 and 301 that do the side chain, that let Bitcoin Core send coins out to other pieces of software and, and get them back. But we also built the side chain template. Um, so that you could see, you know, you have an example of a side chain. And in fact, we've already, we've already tweaked that template to be like the kind of, you have like a large block version of Bitcoin and also a Zcash version. Uh, so we're kind of testing all that right now. But yeah, that's part of what I've been working on. We, oh, oh, he, uh, Paul, I'm really interested in some of that stuff you just said, because I, I did interview David from MasterCoin recently. I interviewed uh, the RSK guys. Um, yeah. You know, I'm from Toronto, so I obviously, you know, I interviewed Anthony DiOrio, the founder of Ethereum. So I know I know all these things really well. But curious, um, okay, first of all, RSK, is that not a side chain? Well, yeah, this is the problem is the word has kind of gone crazy. But mm. I, it, if you... Yeah, did, did you see Sergio r r made a recent post and he said that, see, this is the thing is everyone in, w in the, when you get to the details, it's clear that they're, it's aspiring to be a side chain, but not yet a side chain. Right. So in Sergio's most recent post about the different two way peg that he, the new two way peg he had researched, he says that still the long term goal is to actually make, to put rootstock on. Drive chain, which is a side chain secured completely by proof of work and by the mining process. So it's still aspirational. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and why? But it's similar to lead to what Blockstream had always said about the federated peg that that was always supposed to be aspirational. That was like we slap this band aid on. We'll just get this so we can get something going. But the goal was always to make it lose its reliance on these third parties custodians okay this is super interesting um wh what is it about uh oh first of all are you uh, just so people know because we didn't really do the intro but like do you consider yourself like a bitcoin core developer if you, at one point or are mm. you or do you consider uh, yourself more like oh, i guess I, yeah i would definitely say like um I'm a big, sorry i'm pouring myself some water it's all good um, I would say that I am a Bitcoin maximalist and a Bitcoin core contributor. Certainly people have like cited a lot of stuff I've written on my blog and passed it around. So for whatever that's worth, 
some of the other stuff in my blog is ignored and, and still is uh, ripe for being stolen and passed around, you know, years later. Um, but uh, I think um, that, I don't know, I, I, you know, I've been invited to speak at the scaling conferences. I was on the program committee at one, at one point. Oh, oh, so, oh, I don't okay. know. I don't know. I, dude, like, dude so I have, your, I have like, your blog open, okay? And, and I was reading through it before or before a call. And so I got to ask you a couple of, for some TLDRs here. So, okay, first one is the first one. Why proof of stake isn't cheaper and isn't better than proof of work, okay? <laughs> Can you talk to me about this? Because, I mean, if you look through my, my interviews, I mean, like three or four of them, I'm like trying to figure this out no, by dude, asking I'm people. I'm trying to figure it out myself because, you know, if you see, if you talk to me, the, man, talk to me, check the comment section on where I wrote the one that got really famous was nothing is cheaper than proof of work. And that was okay. in 2015. And in the comment section, like people show up, Jay Kwan, Vlad Zamfir. And I thought that I'd convinced them that proof of stake is not cheaper than proof of work. Okay, so talk to me why it's cheaper because I mean that okay, just sounds this super counterintuitive and like because the narrative is not that change the intuition because okay, each block has a certain block reward. So let's just you what you have to do is temporarily for the sake of argument and simplicity, in fact, abstract away from the idea that Bitcoin has 21 million coins and Ethereum has some other thing. Just imagine they all had 21 million coins, okay. and they're all 50 coins for four years and then it gets halved because that's a whole separate thing that has nothing to do with. The point that I'm about to make at all, but it's confused, it'll be misleading to you if you get distracted by that detail. So, okay, 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 and, I'm with so you. you. And, and by if Bitcoin and Ethereum, I really just mean like Bitcoin with proof of work and Bitcoin with proof of stake. Maybe that's easier. I don't know why, but you know, because the Ethereum people are so crazy about proof of stake. Um, so <laughs> you have in each case, you have whatever it is, a certain amount of coins coming in every block. So right now it's 6.25, but let's just say, cause it's easier with 50. And, you know, let's say there's one Bitcoin worth of fees cause there usually is. So let's say there's 51 Bitcoin, every block. This is totally, this has nothing to do with the meat of the argument at all. This is just for simplicity. Just say every single block has 51 coins going to the miners. I'm with you hundred percent so far. Now, you know, these coins, let's make it even simpler and say the exchange rate never changes. And it's always, let's just say it's always $10 per Bitcoin, you know? Okay, I'm with you. What a horrible thought. What's well, the science each, project? We're, we're each, these, each these are the uh, fixed variable. Okay, I gotta go ahead. Bitcoin, $510, right? So every block is worth $510. And who gets the block? Anyone can get it because anyone can join the mining process at any time. And even if they can't, anyone could join whatever it was that shortlisted them at some point, you know? It's an open process. It's not like something where there are only 12 federal board, uh, yeah. board of governors for the Federal Reserve, and it's capped at 12. You can't get more, you can't get 13. Um, so it's, the blocks are worth $510 every block, every 10 minutes. So what I say in the post is that this is a lot like a guy going up on a stage and auctioning off a briefcase with $510 in it. He says, I'm going to sell this to the highest bidder. Anyone can bid. Here it is. It's five, it's $510. So what do you think the, what do you think the, it's going to go for at the end of the day? It's going to go for like $509, you know, mm. you're going to bid. No one's going to bid 510. No one's going to, certainly no one's going to bid 520. Right. I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. So it has nothing to do with proof of work, proof of stake. It's just that's how valuable the blocks are. And so whatever they are, that whatever the system is, people are going to fight over that until they can get the... It's the money coming in that is the problem. Hmm. It's not the structure of proof of work, proof of stake. It's the money coming in. The money coming in. And yet that's the same in both scenarios. So it will be the same with proof of stake. With proof of stake, you have to... Uh, pledge coins. You have to lock up these coins. Yeah, but that has a cost. You know, that's money that's not spent in the economy or invested in the economy. Um, and but worse than that, it's 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 misleading because in proof of work, this money that's spent on electricity or whatever on uh, stuff, it's easy for a human being to think about, imagine in their mind a giant waterfall with 
giant turbines and Bitcoin mining equipment humming very loudly, and little lights and things. So with Ethereum, it would just be staked. And so it, many, much more money would be staked than burned because it'd be like the interest. So if the interest rate's like 5% and you burn $5 in proof of work world, you'd lock up $100 in the proof of stake world, 20 times as much. And in fact, a lot of people aren't using their coins for anything but far from that being a sign of efficiency, all that means is that even more money would be locked up. That's all that money would be locked up and then some, because that's the equivalent of like free energy somewhere in the proof of work world. So what would happen if there's a giant waterfall with free energy and other... One, okay, we're back. Sorry, a little glitch, glitch there. So yeah. yeah, so you said, what would happen if a waterfall had free energy and I the lost you there? In the work world, you just burn all that energy. So it's free, but because it's so cheap, you burn it. So this is equivalent to, in the proof of stake world, money that people aren't using for anything. Well, sure, they'll stake it in proof of stake, but this just means more money is staked. So the amount of money that's gonna would be staked in the proof of stake world would be enormous. It would be an absurd amount of money. Um, it would be much more than is spent in proof of work. It wouldn't be destroyed, but it would be staked. So the whatever you could have in, used it to invest in something, you would not be able to. Yeah, I see that. I see that point. Uh, is that the main argument? Is that so that, that those funds could have been used for something else? Yeah, it's not just the staked funds, though. I have no idea. It depends on the details of proof of stake. It's like if you're offline, you can be slashed. So it's like, will people compete on denial of service attacking each other? Or will they compete on building software that stops them from being, or hardware that stops them from being denial of service attacked? The real mo problem is the money coming in. If the money's come, if that much money is coming in, that means you have a big incentive to be, to collect the money and to be the only one collecting that money. You want to kick everyone else off. And that means you have an incentive to do all this stuff. If it's a huge amount of money, I mean, think about how much it actually, the number ac actually are um, in Bitcoin where, I mean, how much is it? It's like seven or eight Bitcoin, $20,000 a coin. Um, so already this is like 160,000. It's like, that's just, and then a thousand blocks every week. So uh, it's like hundreds of millions of dollars per week, um, you know, billions of dollars per year. So that's all yours if you can just knock everyone else on the network off. Or if you can just give yourself a 1% advantage, you know, <laughs> it's like $100 million. So whatever it is, people will be looking for a way. And that is the real reason. But this is just one example that I just want to show that locking up money does have some cost the fact that you can't deploy money in the economy um that is a cost probably more so than just some stupid waterfall that you're gonna like you know run a little bit more water through the turbines than over the top but i don't know the point is this isn't like the the role of the economist isn't to like actually chart it all out it's just this equilibrium thing this certain amount of money is coming in so that's how much money will be wasted, wasted in quotes. See, the, that's $510 comes in. The auctioneer auctions it off. The person pays $509, $509 wasted. It, it shouldn't be different in proof of stake. Mm. Everyone's attempt to convince me that it will be different. I haven't been convinced. So that's hence these, po these posts. So that's why it won't be cheaper as far as it not being better. You know, there are a lot of problems with proof of stake. At a certain point, people have just stopped arguing. I think, though, in a way, the results speak for themselves, though, because it, proof of stake has been just three months away in Ethereum for since like 2015. And in fact, I remember at Satoshi Roundtable three, right? Um, so what was that? What would that have been? Um, like 2017, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I think so. Um, and there was a guy there that was it. Uh, and this guy, we were in a big group. This guy was talking about the greatness of proof of stake and the greatness of Ethereum. And he was so convinced. He literally offered to buy me a ticket to fly to April, to fly to Paris in April for this proof of stake unveiling. Cause this was like in late January. 
He was so convinced, and he was like, and you can watch as we turn on proof of stake. And he was just brimming with confidence. And I told him, well, you know, I've been hearing this for a long time. I've been hearing this for years. For years, people have said it's three months away. Um, and they've all of those people have been just as confident as you. And don't you realize that? And he said, yes, I realize that I sound exactly like those other people, but this time it's for real. And that was April 2017, but still no proof of stake, right? So it's wait, constantly wait, wait, I, I, I kind of even lost track, to be honest. But are, are, did they did something? So Ethereum 2.0 was unveiled, right, recently? Yeah, but isn't that just a coupon for... It doesn't do anything. It's just a coupon for the next... When when Ethereum 2.0 comes out, you can claim it. Interesting. So, a, so they got nothing to do with proof of stake? Well, they, they haven't have even gotten designs, closer? They get, they get closer every time. I don't know. So what, know. what is it fundamentally that, that why they're not able to solve this problem? Well, I don't do you know. Have I think like they may a, be making progress towards solving it. I just think the results speak for themselves. Of how Is how, it a worthy how, problem to solve? It's not cheaper. That's my point. The whole point was it was supposed to be cheaper. <laughs> I'm supposed to avoid yeah. this cost. But the cost is not a function of the fact that it's burning energy. The cost is a, a shadow of really what's happening, which is the, the problem that the blocks are valuable. Since they're valuable, people fight over them, and that fighting is the wasted energy. And the the good idea from Satoshi was to not only make it so that that fighting contributed to something, which in this case is denial of service prevention. When you get a block header, you can check immediately SPV mode. Also, that you know millions of people use today. You can check all the block headers in like half a second. It's four megabytes per year. You can check that you're on the highest work chain. So, but when you get a new header, you can check the header in instantly. Take the hash. The hash has the right number of zeros or the right value. You can check immediately. You just check 80 bytes. Then you know whether or not you should. The person is a valid peer if they're a if they're a good guy. So not only does it do that, but for to make it cumulative proof of work. Now every new link in the chain makes the entire chain more secure. That was a good idea. There's no real reason to, um, you know, I think people, the other thing is people were concerned about the 51% attack. So there was a hope like in back in 2010 or something, if you go ancient Bitcoin talk post hunting, you can find some stuff about proof of stake. People were thought, oh, this would be great. It's immune to the 51% attack and it doesn't waste any electricity. Like this is the best idea ever. But I think a lot of that stuff about the 51% attack is also just a lack of confidence in in Bitcoin and maybe even in like freedom or something or whatever you want to call it as well because it's a designed to be a process to keep everyone in line and the, the whole 51% attack thing is like it's like solving the wrong problem the 51% attack assumes that you somehow know what's true in advance and you can just it's only a matter of convincing the the other people that your way is the best but the 51, the, the hash rate thing, the, the heaviest chain rule, that is a this method for resolving disputes when like different parts of the world find blocks at different times or disagree over what should be in a block. Or some people say that block is censoring me and other people say, no, it's not. And other people say, you know, you suck or whatever. So it's a process for like finding the truth. Whereas I think a lot of people just think in their mind, they think, well, what if this happened? And that's not what I want. How can I get everyone to do what I want? So it's kind of an anti-liberty thing to even worry about the 51% attack, but to some, to some small extent, not to, not to a big extent. But it was, this was all the stuff that was driving people towards proof of stake in the past. But I think it absolutely is not, if you're smart enough to work on something like this, you should do something else. Especially if there's, you know, there's merge mining, you get all of Bitcoin's hash rate for free. You know, I mean... So, hey, one, one more thing. Why smart contracts are bad for Bitcoin? Curious uh, if you can kind of help uh, give the TLDR on that one. I apologize. I should have read it before, but I'm definitely going to read it after this. But but again, okay, my kind of layman's whatever term in terms of what it, what I thought it was, was that well, what were the big criticisms? One was it was a it was an attack vector potentially. Um, I think it would be, it would bloat the block sizes or something. I mean, there was a couple of different things that, I don't know, that, 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 that were said to me back in the day before Ethereum became, 
you know, because I, I literally talked to Vitalik and he was like, look, we're going to do smart contracts on our own blockchain and Bitcoin core developers will never allow it. And and that was kind of their their thing. Right. So I'm curious why why you're saying why smart contracts are bad for Bitcoin. But then are you is that eventually like getting to the point that well something like drive chain or side side chains should be used? Well, it's a question of, yeah, people should be able to try out their own thing. It's it's kind of annoying because with drive chain, it's kind of like just like the free market and it just says these pieces of software should compete and it shouldn't matter my opinion on what should or shouldn't be done. So you see what I mean? If I were an entrepreneur, I would implicitly have a lot of theories about how a business should be run. There's no getting around it. So I say, I think you should open on time. I think you should have a customer service number or whatever. I think you should sell goods that are really expensive on purpose so that only rich people buy them and it becomes trendy. You know, you can have all these theories when you start a business. Mm. That's different from saying with drive chain is like saying there shouldn't be a monopoly. It shouldn't just be Bitcoin core or, you know, the desolate wasteland of, of competing with Bitcoin core, starting your own altcoin or whatever. Um, so that's a different thing. It depends. Um, so I think oracles are good, but smart contracts are kind of a kind of sad imitation of oracles. That is really oracles are the real smart contracts. That's the real, really important blog post. And some smart contracts are set up so that they interfere with other smart contracts. And it's not, it's not good for it to be general purpose actually, because that eliminates classes of activity that are possible. So it's kind of like if you had a world where um, if you had a world where anyone could steal your name, like, or your brand. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sorry, but yeah, I can a little bit of background noise there. <laughs> yeah. I was mute my having, side. Some people are having fun. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what was I saying? So if imagine that, um, so in the past, Cattle ranchers, uh, the word brand in business, it actually comes from branding. Uh, I don't know if it's cattle or whatever, but it's branding livestock. They would literally brand them with, you know, li a literal brand. And then, because then they'd go out and like graze and then you have to get them back. So you let them out into like the world where you couldn't have, where there was some part of it that was uncontrolled. They'd go off to graze in the pasture and then they'd get them back. And then you had to make sure that you only took back the ones that were yours. So there were all these rules about you can't take someone owns a certain brand, like a certain piece of information. Mm -hmm. Because you couldn't steal, you couldn't say, oh, this is my brand. There had to be some kind of, if there was a dispute, oh, this brand is mine, this is mine. They had to, so you had to like go and register them somewhere. Mm. So in that world, if you couldn't do the brand registration technology, then it would be impossible to have property rights over cattle in that particular way. So sometimes if there's, if there's too much freedom um it only means that complexity is impossible uh, hmm. and so there's a limit to how much whatever a free enterprise you can even have um i mean one thing that's caught you know i think a lot of people's attention is have you heard of what is it called uh oh my god uniswap yes have you heard of these guys um i don't know so i mean about it though, well I, not, I guess what i'm getting i guess what i'm getting at though is is that like so, so the Unocoin, the company I started in twenty whatever thirteen twenty twelve, were like a centralized exchange. I'm not gonna lie, you know, I've thought really deeply about building a decentralized exchange, and you know what I mean. Like, I mean, I, I shared yeah, so with I. you before our call about this whole notion of what happened in in India. I won't go into it, but uh, but I mean, yeah, I, I think about like how can the world function without you know. Um, a centralized entity a lot. And so Uniswap to me kind of, I mean, they, they're doing more volume than that. I don't know. And some days more than Coinbase, more than Binance. So this project like Ethereum that I've been super critical of, many have been critical of in my eyes and some like ICOs. Yeah, I get it. Super scammy, you know, try to stay away from as much of it as possible. Um, but something like Uniswap where they're just enabling like, you know, peer to peer trades uh, it seems like a legitimate kind of, <laughs> you know, cause. Um, and, and I guess where I'm going with this is that I know some people have kind of forked it to build it on RSK. 
but I wonder, you know, what, what's kind of held me back is, is that like, it would be kind of weird to build a Bitcoin, you know, uh, decentralized exchange on top of Ethereum, given yeah. that I'm a Bitcoiner as well. And, and I yeah. see all these like holes Isn't in it. So, it horrible? Yeah. so how does one address Isn't that problem? Terrible? I thought we, this was supposed to be about freedom. You know, I thought what happened to Bitcoin user not affected? What happened to just, you know, um, you know, like doing whatever you want, but now you have to like conform to this weird culture. Um, the, the, there is a delusion, I think, that, I mean, almost most, it is mostly true that the altcoin technology is just terrible and it's not even worth copying and stealing. Mm. But that's not completely true. I mean, as I was saying, counter, so one of the things, Mastercoin and Counterparty, right? The ICOs I, I know both, scams. yeah. They were total mm -hmm. scams, but they were ahead. They, that would have been on Bitcoin if there was some kind of parallel future where that could have been healthily integrated. True into Bitcoin. True. That was all on Bitcoin first. Now, the other thing though, is that what are now, I guess the non-fungible tokens or whatever you want to call them, the NFTs, the stuff that's just funny, like the spells of Genesis, remember the rare Pepe, like all this Where weird is... like screwball stuff. Um, and the crypto kitties on Ethereum. So, um, you know, people like that kind of stuff. That's just like, you know, digital art. That's, you know, that's like, that's like fun. That's like a pure internet thing, you know? Yeah. That's like, you think of like keyboard cat or you think of like whatever, like early YouTube videos where it's just people just having fun, marquee tags, you know, in HTML. <laughs> like, it's just like, just people having fun on the internet. Um, you know, that was, the, so there was all this stuff that was tried. A lot of it was bad. But um, some of it is good. And there is, I think, increasingly, there is a, just this delusion in Bitcoin that all the other stuff in all the other coins can be ignored. And there's a lot of great stuff. Like I like uh, David Vorick's uh, SIA project. You just type in 12 words and it just can regenerate your hard drive. It's like that storage idea, the like bit hard drive idea. So it's like pay people to store all your files. You can get them all back from the blockchain. Um, but there's, you know, and then it's like the Zcash stuff, you know, like the Monero Zcash stuff, like other stuff for people who want to mix their coins so that they don't have to just do right now. You're like stuck with coin join or like whirlpool. You coin, you coin join with like five people. You have to pay a transaction fee every time layer one transaction fee. It could be easily sibled. Uh, you have to pay the whirlpool fee if you use samurai. Whirlpool. Um, that's great. I mean, everyone knows that you're doing it. Everyone can see it on the blockchain. That's a coin join. Um, you know, stuff like what Monero and Zcash are doing is bet is, you know, better than that. If they're, you know, the people talk about liquidity. Um, they say not a lot of people are using X Y Z, so it's worse. But you know, the, the the technique is either better or worse, and then you get all of the users. If, if it was all smooth, it would get the users and it would get the liquidity problem is a, that's a chicken and egg problem. So there's other great stuff, you know. Um, yeah, a lot of the stuff, like I was just talking um, with my other friend, like I was saying with enough trial and error, I I Ethereum will eventually create good stuff, um, unfortunately. And that's true of anything with trial and error. And he said there was not enough trial and error. But eventually what I brought up was that evolution created human beings and everything that we built, you know, symphonies and everything, just from trial and error on just like some little molecules. So trial and error is very strong. And um, people in Bitcoin, are, there's this kind of, um, you know, this kind of cult has taken over Bitcoin. It just says it's preordained for victory and whatever it was satoshi's design is the absolute best and everything else is a corruption of the design and um and that is kind of what sort of prevents people from being interested in drive chain because drive chain says hey what about you could have a big block side chain and people say well, big blocks suck you how dare you even suggest that um that's just you know those are the un the un people who do that but meanwhile you know roger Ver has like a nice wallet that low fees and it's like good experience. So the point of drive chain is that similar to prediction markets, it's kind of a utopian thing. In my brain, it's like in, in the drive chain world, 
you know, no, none of the Bitcoiners hate Ethereum, hate Bitcoin, excuse me, hate Vitalik or something is what I'm trying to say. Is they're like, well, we have this weird guy, Vitalik, but he's got this crazy Ethereum project that's kind of cool. They're all shills for Ethereum because Ethereum uses the 21 million Bitcoin coin limit and there's no second token. There's no altcoin. It would never have been invented like that. You know what I mean? Mm. When people would mix their coins on Zcash. They'd, they'd send their Bitcoin to Zcash as a side chain. Zcash wouldn't be its own coin. They'd send it there and then mix the coins over there where they get super ZK snark mixing and then they'd send them back. Unilateral mixing with every single person in the Zcash pool with just like two transactions instead of Whirlpool where you mix with like four other people and you have to do it every time, you know, over and over again. Um, and yeah, there's like, there's all this other stuff. They have David Vork's thing isn't its own altcoin. It's with Bitcoin. All these things are Bitcoin projects. So everyone is on a team. Everyone's actually supporting each other. Everyone's shilling. Someone like whatever, uh, you know, whatever, like um, Pierre Richard, Dan Held, mm. they would be like shilling Ethereum, you know? It would be a topsy-turvy world where, um, and vice versa, because demand for Ethereum would be going into Bitcoin. And the whole, the public right now, I think, is sort of like kind of baffled by crypto. They're just like, you know, what is going on? They don't know what to do. And they're like, I'm going to wait until they figure this out before I invest. But in the drive chain world, it's unified. There's just one, the only one thing to buy. There's lots of software to try out, but there's only one unit of Bitcoin. And there's only one lower thing to settle to. There's one small block to settle to. And then there's Roger Veer is using the large block side chain. And then no one has a problem with it. The same way they have this vitriolic hatred of of Bitcoin Cash, so so the drive chain world is like a totally different world, very much like the prediction markets. Well, you, everyone should just want to live in my head where everything is great. Everything is great in here. Well, well, what, uh, why isn't drive chain okay? Wait, so is drive chain where you want it to be, or are there still some things that the core developers need to do to kind of enable the full vision well, of yeah, it? It's a uh, it is a soft fork, so it's like SegWit, where it has to be activated. But we haven't quite finished it. Um, mm. I keep tinkering with it and I'm kind of lazy about it and I'm kind of a perfectionist about it, but you can go and try out. We have testnet software so anyone can download it and, and check it out. It's great. Uh, you go to drivechain.info and it's right there. You can find the downloads page. The link is right at the top. But, but yeah. Is it like it's like, is it kind of like a Turing complete environment? Is it well, like it, that? It in, is, in... Um, a Turing completeness is a, a phrase that has been like beaten to death by yeah. this community. And I don't know if we should continue using it or not, but you can send the coins to any piece of software. So just passively, it is universal. It can simulate any altcoin. And so since it can simulate Ethereum, it, um, it has access to Turing complete scripts or turn complete anything okay and uh and yeah and so it, the, the segue comment about how it needs to be soft fork so um what like is that something i mean but it seems like there's is there hostility in, in doing that or is it kind of like obvious now like are people like okay well we would need to do this i honestly think people are baffled by it um i think well there's a lot of ptsd from the last soft fork you can see even with something like taproot that's very very popular among the elite developer communities it's like the slowest thing possible in fact i remember it was Satoshi around table five maybe i get them all confused mm. but i think it was at least i think it was maybe at least 20 it may have been 2018 i think it was 2019 though i'm gonna say where they said by the summer someone there told me competently so by the summer, it will be activated activated via BIP9. But that was, they were wrong about that. Obviously, we'll be blown way past summer 2019. And still, nothing in sight. And still, what people propose is some of these proposals have an activation timeline that is like three years long or something ridiculous. You know, you've seen some of these, right? Where it's mm. like, you try BIP9, then it, then it like stalls, and then it activates via BIP8, like after 12 months after that. It's like 20. 23 <laughs> we'll have we'll have taproot you know so um i'm not sure maybe the protocol has become ossified 
faster than anyone thought. Or, but I really, what I think it is, is just people are baffled by it. When people do critique it, it's clear that they have no idea um, what it does or how it works, which is why I have worked very hard in the to to help make the GUI better. So, if you use the testnet software, it should at least be possible. Ideally, it'd be. I don't know. You know, I try to make it ideally in a certain way. I think it's easier for people to figure out exactly what's happening, but that's for them to judge and not me, but certainly when you go and you like make a deposit, you see the deposit to the side chain. When you make the withdrawal, you see it shows up in like a little queue, it shows up in a little thing. Those little boxes with question marks, you can like click on them and then this explanation written by me will show up and explain what is going on. So I tried to work on that because and I, I try, I continue to try, you know, present tense, because that's what I'm working on is making this thing, this as a kind of demonstration. And then I think, um, I think then people will be in a better position to look at it. Um, and then, yeah, I plan on making like a little like video, you know, like one of those little videos to like, because all the videos I currently make were to address the expert audience. The, so criticisms from Peter Todd, Greg Maxwell, whatever, like uh, people like that, um, Matt Corral or whatever. So the, 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 that's like the intended audience for like stuff like that. And it's like extremely theoretical and weird. I have to make like the, uh, just like the, the little bit, like you remember that video that Peter Todd made back in the day, the keep Bitcoin free and it had like the dorky little xylophone and it was like, but it was a great video. But it was I don't, I don't think I saw it. I so interviewed. Just, well, you you mentioned it. it. Yeah. I did. I saw it. It's an immensely controversial video, hmm. but it was a pretty good video. It's like short. I, I mine won't be as good as that. It'll be like a little. But I have to make like the point is I have to make like a video for a more general audience. Although it's funny, I remember seeing the video because Peter Todd spoke. I think it was like 2013. Like it's like this, like in the Javits Center in like New York City or something, and. Every single person in the room, including me, was just baffled, just totally baffled. Couldn't understand what he was even talking about with this block size debate. Like, I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> I don't think anyone had any idea. <laughs> this was like a long time ago. Um, uh, um, okay, well, how can, how can people help, though? Like, normal people, if, or not normal people, but let's say some programmer dude is, like, thinking, and oh, for in my case, like I said, like, I I, we, we're not i'm not gonna lie like i think a lot about building you know like just decentral whether it's like p2p platforms right given yeah. like p2p like like better versions of local bitcoins or you know like things yeah. like that 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 really you know i think it's like 0.5 percent of the world right now maybe has bitcoin um and banking can sometimes be a big challenge and so we've seen how you know how that can be obviously devastating and so I, I think a lot about like how do you how do you make it so that you know even in the face of uh tyranny we're able to commerce between yeah. one another i think Absolutely. that is a very noble cause but i also don't like the idea of building highly you know uh, i guess the what's the word subversive you know technology on like a server that sits in my house or something like i'd rather right. you know think about building stuff like that on on something like bitcoin um but again, you know, I guess, uh, you know, for, but but if, if the Bitcoin community isn't welcoming of that, and, and I can respect that too, because like, you know, Bitcoin wants to do one thing really well. I always, it always struck me as like side chains as like, and like drive chain as like a very technologically responsible way of fostering innovation yes. and simultaneously preserving the core exactly. benefits right. of that Bitcoin. That was the real when drive chain really got going it was like 2016 the block size debate was going crazy ethereum the price of ethereum was going crazy um people in bitcoin were like depressed this is what they called the long sideways or whatever from like 2014 to like 2017 um the and but was in particular what was absurd about it was explicitly with si all side chains all side chain designs are, are known to me that are not like some secret mandatory hard fork. Uh, some, it, this is like technical and weird, but the point is basically 
you with sidechains, you don't want the full node to be responsible for the sidechain. So you have to ignore some stuff over there, but you can't ignore everything because then it just becomes an altcoin. So the middle ground was this SVV proof concept. And so the sidechain only has SPV security, but on it, you can do whatever you want. And it just became absurd because the small block people hated SPV security. They hated it. And the large block people loved it. They were just in love with it. Every single time if you brought up anything on Twitter, they'd say, blah, blah, blah. The longest chain will never contain that because someone will raise the alarm. It's super easy to identify if a block is bad or if a transaction is bad. They loved it. They loved SPV. So it was the perfect thing because with uh, side chains, the large block people could have their own SPV side chain and it would never bother the main chain at all. The main chain could say small block. Do you know much everyone, about liquid? Do you know much about liquid? They want. Yes, I do. Just thoughts. I isn't that a side chain? I'm no. probably like, so That's isn't it supposed to be or was it? It's, it's, no, as I said, it's aspirational. They say, mm. uh, I have another post on drive chain. I can send it to you. The drive chain has its own blog. And then I said, is liquid a real side chain? Question mark. Greg Maxwell weighs in. Um, and that one's short. But the, no, Liquid is like a custodial multi-signature wallet that holds BTC. But it's also this other thing that has a federation of servers that has its own kind of like counterparty-like thing. Um, now, coins, Bitcoins go in and they can come back out. But when they come out, it's only because X number of people in the multi-sig agree that they can come out. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that, but the 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 reason that it's not what I what was originally envisioned is that it doesn't solve the problem of altcoins. It's not if could can Roger Veer use Liquid to create a large block version of Bitcoin Core, and then he because he would have done that and send send coins there, and then Bitcoin Bitcoin.com would be shilling that thing. No, but Liquid is custodial. That's the other thing too. Is there's there's a group of people who own the coins. And those, you know, that's a list of names and addresses. You know, that's no different than what the stuff that Bitcoiners used to laugh at, like when Dan Larimer and 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 Vitalik, they would do stuff like that. Well, they'd say, well, you know, like delegated proof of stake was like that. You know, that was like, well, the couple people have servers, but um, but it's not a big deal because the servers will only be used if X Y Z happens. You know, that's just a quick hack that they threw together because they thought they would later do the, the real side chain stuff. Oh, what Greg Maxwell says, the true two-way peg. So he's in a, there's a video, he clearly refers to the true two-way peg in contrast to liquid. Liquid is only this temporary sort of stopgap. It's, it's not, and you can see why you can't use it. How can you use liquid to send, how can I use liquid to make turn complete how can I use it to make Z address transactions like in Z with ZK snarks from Zcash? How can I use it to do the prediction market thing that I want to do? If I could, I would have just done that. I wouldn't have needed to do with, with drive chain. The only reason I bothered with drive chain at all in the first place is because I was working on this prediction markets idea. If I could use liquid for that, I would have I would have done that. Yeah, you yeah. Know that you, because you know that you can't you can't use liquid for these other things. And when you put it into liquid, it is it is owned by those other people. It's no different than if you had Mt. Gox and Mt. Gox had a server that was secured with multiple like SSH keys or something. It's, hey, Paul, have you looked at Solana at all? I'm just curious if you heard about these yeah, guys. Yeah, but I can't quite remember it. You have to refresh my memory. I have looked at it. They're out of, um, what's that uh, chip? Qualcomm. It's like, I don't know, a whole bunch of guys out of Qualcomm. It's like proof of history, proof of, proof of, I don't even know what's anyways, but I have a question. So, so given that problem statement that I was mentioning earlier is like building, you know, decentralized applications, let's say, you know, within the exchange space, whether it be fiat to crypto, whether it be crypto to crypto, if someone were to embark on that, like today, what, 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 what would be their path to, or optimal path towards like building something, you know what I mean? Like, is, is it Ethereum then at the end of the day, just because of all these, like uh, the it's facts exactly. that you don't, huh? Yeah. Why well, I, I empathize with it. I mean, it is, it's annoying because there has been in the drive to safeguard Bitcoin core from this 
corruption there has been mm. like a lot of suppression of creativity you know mm. so if you want to just try something that's considered fun on ethereum but it's considered like a nasty attack in bitcoin um you're not supposed to try until you you know you're supposed to like be an apprentice for seven years at chain code and, and supposed to whip yourself and be and live as a monk for 40 years and then only after meditating on the code and reciting Satoshi's white paper backwards at the full moon can you like open a pull request that's not for like a unit test or something but um so so it's hard if you want to do something you know one weird thing that i wanted to do in my head that i think is great that people should do is i might even try to do it myself or something I think there should be something in the GUI, the Bitcoin GUI for HTLCs, because you could do the coin swap thing just by yourself in the software. You just need to make a little thing that says, I send Bitcoin to this, it's locked to this hash, or it comes back to me after a certain amount of time. And if you just built that, then all you need to do is have someone else, Ethereum, Litecoin, just kind of like copy it and put it into their GUI. And then people could just meet like on Reddit or whatever, anywhere, IRC, whatever it is, you know, wherever it is people meet. And they could just say, I'll trade you, you know, five Litecoin for whatever, a tenth of a Bitcoin. Um, and then you could just do it in the software and you'd have a cool little GUI and it'd be, you'd lock it to the same hash because one person would go first and then the other person would go second and then you could just complete the trade. So then you have basically you have basically um, shape shift or, or side shift or a lot of what maybe Coinbase does. I have no idea the figures, but the point is you could do it on your own. And then maybe that would be something you would go, you would, Jeffrey Brito or whatever would say to Congress. They'd say, look, hey, they already do this. It has nothing. So that's why you have to allow shape shift or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm. From, and then from there, it's actually pretty close because if you have something like Tether, and I'm very skeptical of Tether. I The whole time I've been wondering, like, when is the Tether thing going to come to some kind of bad end? But so so far to them, they've done okay. But the point is, if you just have something like Tether... Tether is counterparty, right? Uh, I, th I think they've kind moved of. it onto everything. They moved it. It's on Ethereum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was on counterparty mm. via, like, MasterCoin or something. Um. And I think it I think it was Mastercoin protocol. And then it's on Ethereum and it's even on Bitcoin Cash. So it's like it's kind of moved around, which is probably smart. But it's on all those things at once. And the issue is um, if something like that exists, or even if it's like Amazon gift cards or something, you know, just something that's a cash like, if you could just HTLC with that somehow, you know? Mm. If you could just if somehow you could get that to do HTLC, then you have the decentralized exchange. And that's it. It's just another little tab in Bitcoin Core or in Electrum or whatever, your whatever your own wallet that you make. You're talking about like a crypto to crypto still? Or are you talking about like the so local Bitcoins? Crypto, for Tether, it would still be crypto to crypto if Tether mm. is considered a crypto. Right, so right. Mean, yeah. I know but, what then, you mean, I mean. but then you see it's just specialization. So that's all from the comfort of your own home possibly behind VPN or Tor or whatever. Okay, so that's great. And then all you need is that last link of converting US dollars to Tether. But any, spe or and back, but some specialist could do that. You see, yeah. if you would need it, as long as it were possible, you wouldn't necessarily need to do it. You would just say, I'm gonna keep this in Tether because it's it works for me. And then only a specialist would have to actually swap them back and forth. But I was saying with the Amazon gift cards, maybe you could like make it even further. It, 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 Paul, we, we kind of just like riffed on all these like super, I'd say, I'd say relevant, interesting, crazy ideas, but uh, we didn't really, uh, I mean, we're kind of at the end of our time. We didn't really cover any of your story, um, but we did oh, cover yeah. your projects a little bit. I was going to say, dude, if you're down, I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm not going to lie. It did make my brain hurt a little bit. <laughs> 
<laughs> just because you made me think uh like you know if the, you had like a little processing meter on my brain it was like like it was at 90 it was at like red the whole time uh normally i'm a lot more like just like okay i got this because i got a formula but you took me out of that it's all good i like that i like that um okay so dude i was gonna say um i'm down to do a follow-up you know and and do more of a deep dive on your story if you're even interested yeah, sure. um i'm also down to do you know like a private meeting as well because i'd love to t- chat with you further about some of these ideas um but where do people find out about you you know the great work you've been doing and like is there like is it twitter is it like a, is yeah, there a website that twitter. you i'm truth coin on twitter t-r-u-t-h-c-o-i-n this is my name is very difficult to spell but i i think if you want to learn the sites all, all the websites link to each other so i have truthcoin.info is my blog bitcoinhivemind.com is for and, and truthcoin is your ico right <laughs> yeah it's just a blog <laughs> It's a blog. I'm um, kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, we, Uno yeah, coin. We yeah, get that all the time. Yeah. So it's okay. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, drivechain.info. So for those drivechain.info. Okay. The awesome. Sites, they all link to each other. So you sweet. Can find them. And then on Twitter, you're at uh, truth yeah. at truthcoin, right? That's right. Okay. 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 Awesome, man. Um, well, I know, like I said, uh, yeah, if you want, like we can do another follow up some other time. With that said, any any last words or should we bring this one to an end? No. No. no? Last words for me. No last words. Why wise, wise, wise words of wisdom? No. All right, Paul. I think you've already hit us up with enough of those. I'm gonna kill this. <laughs>